Aurora TV. The world is thinking. Stuart Schulzke here in Copenhagen right now with Chris Mooney, who is a Knight Science Fellow at MIT, uh, also here now with Mother Jones, and he's an author uh, most recently of Unscientific America, if I have got yeah. that right. Yep. And uh, let's actually start with that, with, uh -huh. uh, with Unscientific America. Yeah. I, the, the, uh, the title is very suggestive, yeah. and uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on what it suggests. Yeah. Well, it's a book about how on controversial scientific topics especially, uh, we just have a really hard time having the best information get through to the public um, via the media so that we can get progress. And of course, global warming is the number one example, but there's many, many others where you've had like complete stasis on, on the teaching of evolution for something like 40 years. Right. I mean, we, we just can't move these issues, and we try to look at why we can't move these issues, why it's so dysfunctional, and we come up with a lot of different answers. Could, could you maybe put forward yeah, at least yeah. one of those answers? Well, like, well I, basically, maybe apply it to global warming. Uh -huh. since, you know, that's what Let's say global warming. I mean, you have, um, you have a number of different factors going on. You've got um, the media, which for a long time treated as a 50-50 balance situation, and so they obscured uh, to the public, the policymakers, et cetera, the growing strength of the science. Eventually they got away from that, but at the same time you had a dramatic change in the media, away from an emphasis on science-centered journalism, so it's now dying. Uh, and you have the rise of the blogosphere, uh, where global warming denial is actually running rampant. And I think it's totally gotten us whooped in terms of, you know, like pro-climate bloggers versus anti-climate bloggers. Um, so the shifting media environment has been very difficult uh, for good science. And then at the same time, another factor that we talk about a lot in the book is the scientific community just really not understanding or being able to really deal with the kind of hardball that is being played by their opponents. Uh, so one of the things we call for is, you know, we journalists, we need more help from the scientists. We need them to really realize what they're dealing with uh, and uh, adapt to it. So to, just to, to give an example, mm -hmm. recently, about, I don't know, two months yeah. ago, article from the BBC mm -hmm. of all fairly surprising yeah. places uh, mm -hmm. suggesting that there has not been warming yeah. in the last decade. Yeah. Uh, they love that. How does that fit it's into so this bogus. Picture? It's okay. so bogus. I mean, it's the kind of misinformation that's put out by the other side that is based on tweaking and misinterpreting a very complex issue. Um, but it's simple. It's a simple message and you can really spin the public and you can deceive a lot of people. And I think that this particular soundbite has probably fed into the fact that we're actually seeing you know, a reversion in terms of U.S. public opinion on global warming. People are accepting it less now, which makes no sense if you just think about the state of the science. Let me explain briefly what it is with this claim that we're cooling. We had a very high temperature year in 1998. Mm -hmm. that, was in, that was, everybody remembers the crazy El Nino, mm -hmm. right? El Nino makes the globe warm, and that was 98. Now, only some temperature records place that as the hottest year on record. In fact, a lot of others place it at 2005. So if you actually didn't cherry pick 98, you would say we've been cooling, it would still be BS, but you would say we've been cooling since 2005. So first they pick one of the record years, ignore the others, because the, the, you know, the, the, the data sets aren't exactly, exactly the same. Uh, but then also they ignore the fact that the average of all the years since 1998, the 2000s are much warmer than the 90s, right? And so you don't pick the record year and select that and say that, oh, it must be cooling. Um, because no one ever said that global warming was going to be every year hotter than the last year. That's not how it works, and that's not how it would ever work. Uh, you have, uh, as I understand, done a little bit of research recently on geoengineering. Right. And we actually just spoke with uh, one of the political correspondents from the Times of London who, who uh, indicated that the hopes for a real like breakthrough deal mm -hmm. in the next 48 yes. hours are not very high. Yeah. And, uh, and you've indicated that mm -hmm. if that deal does not come about, mm -hmm. then geoengineering is mm -hmm. what's on the horizon. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, sure. uh, about specifically what types of geoengineering mm -hmm. and who's behind it. Right. Well, yeah, I think it's directly related. Insofar as we don't fix the climate problem in the traditional way, which is stop emitting, uh, then the untraditional way, which is kind of scary, which is called geoengineering or planet modification, is going to gain momentum. And it's going to gain momentum out of, because of fear because people are going to be afraid that global warming is going to run away. 
and be uncontrollable, or actually some impacts are going to happen, especially maybe the developing countries who are the ones that are most concerned and want the strongest accord here. You know, something's going to happen where, where one by one or, you know, maybe as a group, they start saying we want geoengineering because the rich countries of the world haven't done anything uh, to protect us against climate change. So I, I know there was a little bit of controversy not too long ago when the, uh, the yeah. gentleman, the authors of Super Freakonomics right. uh, suggested Mm -hmm. You can actually probably explain yeah. what they suggested. Well, they, they, you know, there was a lot of things that were very wrong with the way they depicted the global warming issue in that book, mm -hmm. and it's been completely eviscerated by a lot of experts like Joe Rahm uh, of Climate Progress. But basically, one of the things they did is they said, oh, you know, we don't need to deal with global warming through cutting emissions because there's this really cool thing called geoengineering. And it's just silly and irresponsible. No serious climate scientist who is considering geoengineering thinks it's the alternative to cutting emissions. Right. That's not the point. The point is that cutting emissions is proving so difficult that it may be the case that at some point in the future we might need a second uh, backup plan just in order to keep the planet from going completely haywire. And no responsible scientist would consider that unless we were in such a bad situation that there was no other choice. So, to, yeah. So in your view, yeah. that's strictly a contingency. It's, yeah, I mean, and, and to claim that it's an alternative is just irresponsible. So. What is an example yeah. of it, though? Is it the, mm -hmm. the like, like seeding the atmosphere right. with, with right. clouds, yeah. this kind of thing? Not, not clouds, but, um, well, there's several different schemes, um, but the debate has already progressed far enough, and the research has progressed far enough that there's uh, one or two clear leaders, and the one clear leader is stratospheric aerosol infusion. And what that means is, you know, sulfur dioxide up in the stratosphere, above the layer where it causes acid rain. It's quite clear that it reflects sunlight. Uh, these little particles bounce it back to space. So it's been called a planetary parasol effect, and it's been yeah. called, you know, the Pinatubo option because Pinatubo is a volcano that erupted in 1991 in the Philippines, and it blasted so much of this very same stuff up into the stratosphere that it caused a year of global cooling. So it's known that this can work, uh, and it's known not exactly how much it would cost, but that it would cost significantly less than changing the whole energy system. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, is there, in your view, mm -hmm. in, any really legitimate cause for doubting the science behind global warming models? Well, no. I mean, with the caveat that models are models, right. everyone in climate science acknowledges that models are incomplete, and they're incomplete by definition. You know, you're constantly trying to make them better, but no one would claim that you can have a computer that has so many equations and has them exactly right that it's going to be a perfect uh, way of spinning out the climate system or the weather you know, over various time periods. But what you do have is models that have basic physics in them that are right, and you have many different models that largely agree, and then you take the consensus estimate of them, and that's a pretty reasonable way to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Give me your, uh, your most optimistic assessment of the proceedings here, mm -hmm. and what, what, they, what they've accomplished. And, well, and the, the optimistic spin, mm -hmm. and there's really something to it, and you hear people representing the U.S. say this, is look at how far we've come since the Bush years, you know, since earlier than that. I mean, we're really talking about, I mean, you know, if everyone can get on the same page about limiting global warming to 2 degrees Celsius by 2100, I know there's a good argument for that, saying that's not enough, that doesn't put us in an indisputable safe zone. However, that was inconceivable, mm -hmm. you know, five years ago. So, I mean, maybe, I'm not sure I agree, but maybe just hitting that milestone will make it easier to hit further milestones, and it is the way to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, could you now balance that by giving your most pessimistic assessment yeah. of the procedure? My most pessimistic assessment is that um, we're not at all likely, it seems, to do better than that. Um, but the way it works, if you look at the science over time and global warming, is it keeps getting more dire. And people get more worried the more they know. Uh, and also, there's still a huge amount of uncertainty inherent in the projections of just how much warming we're going to have based on just how much carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere because there's a lot that's unknown about the climate system and its various dynamics. So, you know, the less you cut emissions, the more you're rolling dice. And the more you're rolling dice, you could get the upper range of the distribution of how hot it is and then you could have all kind of bad things anyway.